Welcome back to the Foundry's YouTube channel. We're so happy that you decided to connect with us to see what God is doing in and through our church. If you want to stay connected throughout the week, please like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Without further ado, let's dive into the series I'm so excited about called Believe. Um, we're diving in today, week three on this series on the seven churches in the book of Revelation. The seven churches that Jesus speaks through to through the prophet John. Today we look at um, a, a church in the city of Pergamum, which I think that's, that should be a name of every city. Anybody else ever want to live in Pergamum? Okay, just me. I just think it rolls off the tongue. Uh, Pergamum is, um, is a city, well, let's do this. Let's look at Pergamum within the, the lens and the context of its setting, right? It's this amazing cultural city within the Roman Empire. And when we turn our eyes towards it, we can see that there are things going on that Jesus is celebrating. But it reminds me of something. I don't know about you, but I like reading uh, biographies. I like looking into the history of, of different historical figures. Uh, Ron Chernow did a great job with like the Washington book and, and Grant and things like that. Just different histories. I like, I like Winston Churchill. I like how he said, history is going to smile favorably upon me because I will write those histories. I was like, get them, Winnie. Like, I love those kind of things. I like that type of writing. Um, I was reading a writing of a, of a popular Christian speaker, teacher, and leader, and he was speaking of his dad. His dad was in ministry, and he said, my dad was a good man. He loved us. He was faithful to my mom, and it's not that he wasn't tempted, but he didn't fall into the typical vices that seem to grab onto and ruin the lives of those in ministry. He didn't mishandle money. He didn't have inappropriate like, um, contact with people, uh, with women. He wasn't, he wasn't promiscuous. He didn't deal in, in pornography and things like that. He was a faithful and good man. He guarded his heart. It's not that he wasn't tempted with any number of things. He was, he was not an abusive leader. He was kind, but he was firm. He's talking about his dad in almost this historical sense in this way that makes you go, oh, wow, he seems like a great man. And then he says this, but there is this one thing. Satan eventually knew he couldn't get to my dad through these more blatant things, so he went around to the back door of his life, and he said, my dad died a death at a much too young of an age because he didn't control his appetite. And he just, well, literally, he had an aneurysm at a younger age and died well into the prime of his ministry career. And as a, as a father and grandfather, he died because of this. And he said, I believe it was because the devil got into my dad, the back door of my dad's life, and he didn't control this little thing that didn't seem like that big of a deal. It wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't overtly sinful, but it cut his life short. He got in through the back door. Hold on to that thought when we talk about this city called Pergamum and the church that is in it. Because when we look at Pergamum, these people as the church in this city were facing so much so much. It was, it, was like a, it was like a pressure cooker. It was just squeezing in on them. They were culturally facing so many things. And you look at them and you hear the words of Jesus and you begin to not only have a compassion, but you feel like, wow, if I could grow up and be like you, I would be something. To the angel of the church of Pergamum, Jesus said, write. These are the words of him who has the sharp double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even during the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. When Jesus says that the devil lives in your town twice in one verse, you should probably listen. And he's saying it's his capital. It's his capital. And what we recognize in this is Pergamum in the middle of the Roman Empire was thoroughly Greek, okay? So 
the Greco-Roman pantheon would have been present, the pantheon of gods. So all these, these, these pagan gods would have been the norm for them. You know, Zeus and Apollos and all these different things. So their Pergamum really was an epicenter for religion in the Roman Empire, a religion and culture. They were a very cultured city. Nearly every major deity of the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods had a temple in Pergamum. So any day of the week, you could find something going on in terms of religion. They had a library that was second only to the great libraries of Alexandria. They had theaters and gymnasiums and different things. They were a very cultured and religious society. So we can look at Pergamum and see that like there had to be a lot going on culturally within it. And what we see in this is, well, you know what? Let's do this. Let's just take a look at the different gods you could walk down Main Street in Pergamum and bump into. You know, right next to Frank's would have been Pergamum's altar, the Temple of Zeus, where Zeus lived on Mount Olympus. Zeus was the king of kings in terms of the pantheon of gods. He was the highest. He was the god of thunder and of lightning. I'm dyslexic and got that backwards. Lightning, then thunder. And, um, and he was a god of power. So if you needed God to work on your behalf powerfully, who would you go make an offering to over at the temple for Zeus? So we look at that and we see that's there. And the temple of Dionysus. Now this is a different cat. Dionysus is weird, and there's a historical uh, figure that kind of relates into the story in a weird twist way. Um, the mother of Alexander the Great is, is thought to be, in the, in the Greek pantheon, she is thought to be the child, the daughter of Dionysus. She's a pretty dark, uh, well, witchy woman. Um, so it's a good musical reference. Nobody? No? Okay, I'll go with it. All right, so she's this kind of dark brooding figure, and Dionysus, get what he's the god of. It's basically Mardi Gras. He's the god of wine, partying, and immorality. Wine, partying, and immorality. Pleasure, the god of wine, and revelry. He's basically Mardi Gras. That's what he is. So if you're ever looking for a good time and you feel religiously down, you can go there. But he was also the god of of this chaotic revelry. And it would get so debased and so immoral and so horrible during the festivities of the Temple of Dionysus that people would lose their lives in the perversion, the revelry, and the drinking that went on there. So that's going on in the city of Pergamum. The Serapis Temple, also the god Isis, which you think, wait a minute, right? It's an Egyptian god. So they went and they found a 1,400 plus year old god from Egypt and they brought him along because why not? Everybody's in the pool. Let's have some fun. Now, the interesting thing about the, um, the Serapis Temple is it's this Egyptian god, thousands of years old, totally distinct and different from the Greek pantheon. And the, the apis bull is the symbol of this worship. And the reason this is important is because when Jesus refers to the people and he says, you remain true to my name and you didn't renounce your faith in me, even during the days of Antipas, my servant, where did Antipas die? In front of the temple of Serapis was a structure of the apis bull. And they put him in there and they burned him alive. This is what these people lived under. It was a spiritual soup. It was anything you need you can go find. That For every need or want you have, there's a God to serve your pleasure. Here's how I would like to explain for us who are here what it would be like to be in that city as a Christian. Now, if I use U of M and MSU it gets too politicized. People hate on each other up here in Michigan, Sparty and Go Blue. Okay, so let's just move them aside, okay? Let's just say you got tickets to see either U of M or MSU at Happy Valley at Penn State because we can all agree we hate the Nittany Lions. And um, you go there, there's 110,000 crazed Pennsylvanians 
and you scalp two tickets, let's just say you're in maize and blue, okay? Maize and blue, half maize, half blue. You're just geared up. You get your tickets from a scalper. You go in, you walk in, and you see as you're walking around the perimeter of the, the stadium at Happy Valley, you see the section, and you look below it, and there's 20,000 people wearing only white, and it's the student section, and you're in the middle of it. That's what it would be like to be a Christian in Pergamum. What would you do? Just go blue, you know? I mean, unless you guys are gonna stomp me to death, right? Because it would be awkward to be in the middle of 20,000 raving mad Nittany Lion fans wearing maize and blue right in the middle of it. Your team scores, you're like, hey. Unless that offends, right? You wouldn't want to turn them against you. You would tread very lightly. Think of how brave these Christians are. Now we can weigh the words of Jesus knowing the cultural context of what was pressing in on them. They know what it's like to stand out from the crowd. And when that crowd hates God and you love him and you serve Jesus Christ, it's terrifying. You remain true to my name. You didn't renounce your faith. Jesus is obviously proud of who this church is. They were keeping themselves pure. They could even say back to God, look at how hard we're trying, God. Look at how hard we're trying to be faithful to you. And Jesus would say, well done, well done. They're doing good things, and we can all look at it and say, the church in Pergamum is lighting it up. But there's that little word in verse 14, nevertheless. Oh, I think if Jesus ever says nevertheless to me, I'm going to just instant puddle. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm going to just melt away because it never seems to go well. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. The second half of this message comes to us, verses 14 to 17 in Revelation chapter 2. It comes to us and it says some things that should make us shudder. I have this against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, more about him in a minute, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food, sacrificed to idols, and committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you will also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We'll talk about them a little too. Repent, therefore. Repent. Otherwise, I will soon come to you and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So Jesus is not taking this lightly. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give him some of the hidden manna. I will give this person a white stone with a new name written on it. Only the one who receives it knows what it means. So there is this challenge and charge, but the promise of victory. So let's just take a minute, pull back from the church of Pergamum, and rewind the theological and scripture tapes about 1,400 years ago to Numbers chapter 22. In the Old Testament, the Bible has two parts. The New Testament starts with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Old Testament starts with Genesis, ends with Malachi, and that is the Old Hebrew Bible. The New Testament is the testimony of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, in Numbers chapter 22. And if you're new to the faith, you're gonna find the book of Numbers only has words because that's how it's fun to confuse people, right? Anybody else ever like, huh, thought it was a math book. But anyways, Numbers chapter 22, we find the, the children of Israel have left Egypt. They are on the cusp of crossing into the promised land to take on and occupy the land. And there is a king Balak, who wants to curse the people of God. So he hires a diviner, like a man witch. He had to bring him over here, and we're going to have you curse the people of God. Balaam comes, and the Lord opposes him. It's one of the great stories in Scripture. Where, um, And if you did your devotions this week, you would have read this. But uh, what happens is Balaam's riding his donkey, 
and his donkey sees an angel with a flaming sword, and it runs off into a field. You know, just like, you know, he lost control of his car, and it went off into a field. And he gets off, he's like, what are you doing, you know, stupid donkey? He leads him out, gets back on, and the donkey will not stay on the path because the angel of the Lord, he can see it. Eventually, they're, they're in this little walled kind of gateway, and the donkey grinds his ankle up against the stone, like trying to pass by the angel, because the donkey's terrified, and it smashes. Have you ever, like, hit the knob of your ankle on anything? Right? No? None of you? Like, you're getting ready to golf, and you're, like, talking to your friend, you're like, oh. And, you know, he's just, like, pass out. It hurts so bad. This is what happened. He hits the knob of his ankle, rubs it down a stone wall. What do you do after that? You beat your donkey with a staff, clearly. So he wails on his donkey, and he says, if I had a sword, I would kill you right now. And the donkey says, what have I ever done to you? Right? This is the story of Balaam. Balaam eventually after talking with his donkey, um, Balaam realizes he cannot curse the people of God. Multiple times, Balak tries to get him to do it, but he will not curse the people of God. And this really frustrates Balak because Balak has paid him and offered like 21 bulls and goats and stuff for offerings to try to get this to happen. And Balaam will not curse the people of God. And what happens is eventually we find Balaam doing something that is, well, it's subversive. It's underhanded. Eventually he says, look, Jacob's going to steamroll you guys. He's going to put an end to the Amalekites, to the Moabites, and just and they're all sitting there going, great. And then he says this, but you know, one thing you could do is you could send your women into the camp and have them spend some time with the guys, get to know them, marry them. And then when they offer sacrifices to their gods, eventually the, heart, the husbands, their hearts will be turned away from God. And they will basically be brought under the curse you wanted me to speak over them. They'll do it of their own choosing. So he kind of, he goes around the back. He can't curse them. But let me tell you how to get them to curse their own lives. Send your women into the camp. Send your women into the camp. So now that you know who the spirit of Balaam is, so we're talking about a spirit. Jesus isn't saying that Balaam came and gave a sermon in Pergamum. Jesus is saying there's a spirit of Balaam that subverts and comes into the church kind of through the back door. And it does the thing that it slowly erodes the foundation of the people of God being in faithful relationship with their Lord and their God. The spirit is called Balaam by Jesus himself because he goes around to the back door. He's sneaky. He, he has no integrity. So when we see this, we can ask the question, why was Jesus calling them to repent? Why? Would Jesus call them to repent when they are living in such a furnace of fear and like persecution? Why would Jesus call them to repent? They had stood firm against everything in such an awful city. They had not given offerings to these gods, all the gods you can imagine. They had done, wasn't it enough that they had done what was right and been faithful to God? Apparently not, because they were, now catch this, and we need to hear this, like tune your ears with me, church, as we lean into this. They were putting up, they being the church in Pergamum, were putting up with allowing, and I guess you could say ignoring, Balaam's and Nicolaitans. Do you know what the Nicolaitans do? Nicolaitans justify their actions. Cop pulls you over. You're doing 53 and a 35. You tell them you're dyslexic and it doesn't work, but it's awesome. Um, you tell them that and they say, no, you're getting a ticket. You say, but wait, I'm super late for work. That's weird. That doesn't mean you can break the law. Right? That's justifying your actions. Nicolaitans justify their actions. Balaam sneak in the back door. Nicolaitans say, it's okay that it's there. It's no big deal. I mean, you know, it's not that big of a deal. We're being faithful here. They justify their actions. They were putting up with, allowing, and ignoring 
Hidden sin, sneaky little sins, and justifications. Look back at verse 14 with me. Nevertheless, I have these things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught the people of Israel to sin so that they did what? They ate food sacrificed to idols and committed sexual immorality. Jesus is saying this is going on in my church, and it cannot be. I don't care how you justify it as a Nicolaitan would or how you let it sneak in as a Balaam would. This cannot be. It isn't just enough to make sure you're doing good, though. Have you ever, anybody here ever get in trouble with a friend in high school? Oh, thank goodness. All right, you guys are holier than thou. Did did you hear the question? Because I can see some of you, and I've heard some of your stories, and you're lying in church. Because here's the reality. We all got popped in high school at some point. And what'd you do? I didn't do it. It It's his idea. And your friend's like, super wise. I'm never going to see the light of day. Like, you know, you have that friend who got in trouble, and you kind of throw him under the bus. You throw him under the bus because, what, it wasn't me. I was just just there. You know, I I wasn't doing those things, Mom and Dad. It was... You know, my friend, they led me astray. It isn't enough. It isn't enough for you and I to assume that we make sure, well, I'm watching out for me. I'm watching out and making sure I'm keeping myself pure. Remember what he said. I know you live in Satan's capital and you haven't renounced me. You've held fast to the faith. You are doing good. Yet, in verse 14 it says, there are some among you and you're putting up with it. That's the implication. You're putting up with some people in the mix, spoiling the whole thing. You cannot put up with and allow certain things in the church. These sneaky little sins, these justified things that we're going, well, it's okay. I mean, God knows we need to eat, different things like that. You can imagine the justifications, and God's saying, no, it's not okay. Even if you're not doing it, if you know someone else is, you have to speak up. You know, I think back to, um, to when my son Josh was just a little, little fella, and um, Erica would give him some rules and stuff, and he would play. And as every child would do, he'd just slowly drift back towards the thing he wasn't supposed to play with. And she would be busy doing something, and she said, I remember hearing him and knowing that he in the other room was doing what I told him not to do. But he was playing nicely. And if you're a mom, there is an economy to scale on this that says, do I allow him to play nicely because I need a few minutes? And if I do that, am I allowing them to think it's okay not to listen to me? Is my silence endorsing a broken behavior, right? That makes sense, especially to moms in the room. You're like, oh, I do that all the time. I got to repent, right? Because you know it's difficult. It's hard when there is an economy in the home that says I got to get things done, but I also have to keep order. And if they're breaking rules but allowing me to keep order, what do we do? And Jesus is saying on a grand scale with the church, you can't allow people in the church to willfully let and justify sin inside of it. So how do we guard our church from Balaam's and Nicolaitans? How do we guard our church? Because we know that false prophets will come. We know that people will come and teach false gospels, other ways to receive salvation outside of Jesus Christ, other behaviors that earn your salvation in Jesus Christ, other gifts of the Holy Spirit that prove you're a Christian, We have to look and remember that there are people, and a lot of those short and sweet books we talked about in last fall's series is really targeting false teachers. They're going to come. Things are going to try to sneak into the culture and the theology of the church. How do we guard our church against Balaam's and Nicolaitans? Here's what I believe. Knowing that the false teachers will come, be kind, hospitable, and generous to everyone, assume the best in people, and let them come and see the goodness of God within the scriptures and the community he's given us. But we will not amend scripture based on your brokenness. Hear that again. We will not amend scripture based on your brokenness. 
And you can come to me and say, but Eric, I was born this way. Dude, if you want to see the way I was born, check it out. I'm a dumpster fire mixed with a train wreck. I have all kinds of problems, but I'm not who I was. I'm becoming something different, and so are you to be. We will not amend the gospel because of your brokenness and how you were made. We will not justify willful, unrepentant sin. We will not allow things to come into this church that melt like water down the life of the church. We will stand and speak truth, but we will do so by being kind, generous, hospitable, and we use this phrase, come as you are and meet God on his terms, not ours. Not ours. We have a number of people struggling with things that we know are openly sinful behaviors. And my, my invitation to them is come. Come, give your lives to Christ. He'll require it of you. Not me. It's not my gospel. It's his. And his Holy Spirit, which will convict you of sin. And wonder of wonders that they come to my office and say, what do I do with this? It was always so good, and now it's bad. You have to give it. You have to be transformed. We will not amend the gospel, but we will be kind. We will be generous, and we will be hospitable and let people see the goodness of God in Scripture and in this community. And by doing so, we can stand guard, but we have to know what to look for. So here's, here's a few. It's like a road sign, especially out west you'd see this. Like all of a sudden there's these little arrows on the side of the road kind of leaning left. And it says, you know, 35, slow down. Why? Because there's a pretty big turn coming. And in Colorado or California where there's a lot of mountains, generally where those are, there's a large precipice following it and you want to slow down, right? This is one of those things where we should see what to look for. These are caution signs. Someone who makes excuses for your sin. It's okay, don't worry about that. I know you struggle with verbally abusing your spouse, but you know what, you're just, you're a passionate person. It's a lie from the pit of hell and it's damaging your marriage and your family and you're creating a system of abuse and it's ungodly and it needs to stop. So we don't sit and let people make excuses for our sin and believe the lie that it's okay because that's how I was made. Or they try to influence you to sin. I don't know about you, but people can be so cagey about this. They bring you into a candid conversation about somebody and their remarkable faults and how wonderful it is to dwell on them and see how much better God made you. Gossip. Just to, you know, I got, I got a real prayer concern in my heart. I want to share it with you guys. It's amazing. And you're like, you literally, like, you grew a tail during that. It was very devilish. It's not cool right? But they kind of invite you in. Seems so humble and then it pulls you into sin. Maybe you've never seen this. Check this out. Let me show you something. They get you biting into things. They invite you into little areas of sin and misjudgment. The back door. They tell you that you're not having a strong enough uh, faith. You don't have a strong enough faith to, um, to, you know, to be entertained by the things that entertain me. I think one of the gods in our culture right now is entertainment, and we justify. We justify in our community some of the most violent, God-abusing movies, shows, and entertainment, and it is a blasphemy against the gospel. And you're like, well, maybe your faith's not strong enough to handle it, Pastor Eric. Maybe not. It bothers me to my soul, what we count as entertainment. And we'll have people say, well, it's okay. You know, maybe you just trust God. He'll take the bad images out of your mind. Why do they have to be there in the first place? When you're uncomfortable with something, you're like, come on, just, why are you such a chicken? Why is that a thing that has worked for generations? Like getting called a chicken. No, I'm not, and I jump in front of a train. Like, I will not be called that. But they find ways to get us to make foolish decisions that really break relationship with God. Nicolaitans sought to justify their actions. Balaam snuck them in the back door. What little things are sneaking in the back door of your life that are affecting your Christian witness in this community for the glory of Jesus Christ? We have to stand up and remember the words of the serpent to Eve. Did God really say? Yes. Look at Scripture. God really did say that he destroyed the entire earth in the flood of Noah because of the violence on earth. God did say that he created certain things in order for his glory. 
And if we are uncomfortable with it, that's fine. We just can't depart from it because we don't like it. We have to stand up and take our ground. Repent. Repent. Remember what repentance is? It's taking a dig step and turning from sin and going towards God. Following Christ, not only in mission, but in redemption, we take that dig step and we follow him. The church is called to repent. Have you been convicted of letting anything slip into your home, into your family, into your workplace, into the church, into your small group? Let it slip in through the back door because it's no big deal. It's just a small thing. And you find yourself justifying introducing sinful things. I'll be honest, I do. My, my problem is humor. I'll think something's funny and Eric is like, that's ah, super not good. And I'm like, I know, I knew it in my spirit. I still said it. Like, it's, it's a struggle sometimes. Not just Erica. A number of my friends will stand up and say, not good, man. And I'm a pastor. You've got to struggle with this too. We all struggle with this. How do we stand up and take account for what we've let slip in? That means we have to turn and do an inventory in our own spiritual homes and say, what have we allowed that is totally departed from what the gospel called us to be? You know, maybe you... Uh, You've let something slip into your home. You, heard, you got an uncomfortable feeling when your daughter's earbuds weren't turned on and you heard the song playing on her phone, but it's just those kids and their music and you're just gonna let it go and you're letting it slip into your home. You're letting certain attitudes and behaviors about people who are created in the image of God be kind of made into broad statements. You're becoming, you know, you think, I'm not racist. I just, you know, there's just certain people who are different than me. Somehow you're better right? We let these things slip in. We give cultural norms to it. We allow the language of hate and, uh, and pride and sinful, just wrong, well up within us. But hey, we don't want to be those people. We don't want to stand out in the crowd. You don't want to be that mom or that dad who says, no, you can't listen to that. No, you can't watch that. No, you can't be a part of that. Not because you want them to be doorknobs, but because you want them to know Jesus and know that living a life of faith sometimes, like a U of M fan in the middle of Happy Valley, is going to stand out. We cannot be indistinct. We must stand out like the church of Pergamum. Repent, stop, turn, and follow Jesus. Stop, turn, and follow him. Because Jesus said, I will give to those who are faithful the victory. I will give them, they will be victorious. They will eat of the hidden manna, the bread from heaven, and they will be given a stone with a name on it, a special name that Jesus gives them. I will give them an identity and the the strength and the energy to live the life out if they will remain victorious. And I will tell you something. It's the end of wrestling season. I have been watching a lot of wrestling lately. My oldest son wrestles, and um, man, it is so hard to watch these guys work their tails off all year long, and they get locked up in one quick mistake in regionals, and they're a great wrestler, and they get flipped for two points, and a reverse comes, and they lose three to two, uh, three to four in the match, and this kid who's worked, and they, I mean, they just look like leather. They're so strong, and they stand up, and they're watching someone else get their hand raised, and they're holding themselves together, and they run over, and they shake the opposing coach's hand, and they run out the back doors sobbing because they knew they had a chance to be victorious, but one little thing got in the way. Don't tell me that one little thing doesn't matter in this faith. We cannot sit and pretend that it's okay with Jesus Christ and he, that he didn't die for all of our sin. He called us to himself. It's the worst to watch someone lose when they've put in so much. And I think that's what Jesus is feeling for the church in Pergamum. And here's the thing. He is going to put the wood to the whole church for what they're tolerating of some. What I'm challenging you to is this. You're in groups. We do groups in this church. And you're in groups. And if you see sin sneaking in and losing focus, speak up. You're the church. We can't sit and pretend that a little bit of bad doesn't affect the whole thing. We are a church that is called to stand out distinctly in this culture, not by our good works, but by spirit-filled Christian living. And when you live according to the power of the Holy Spirit, 
you literally embody love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. When the world sees that, they're like, I don't know what it is, but I want a piece of that. Go and be a church, fruitful and alive, fully alive in the one who has given you new life in his name, Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you and we thank you for who you are. Guard us and bless us, Lord. Keep us from sin and willful sin that would pull us away from you. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come, that you would fill us, and you would show us whatever it is in our lives that needs to be revealed and transformed by the power of your Spirit. God, help us submit to the work of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to watch this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare for next week, click the link below in the description box. There's where you'll find devotions. Now devotions are a crucial part of the Foundry's weekly rhythm. I hope this message has been encouraging but also challenging for you. And we'd love to see you again next week.